Um, my country of my birth in India, uh, I'm all, always horrified by the inherent second-rate citizenry that sometimes is afforded to, for women. There is a lot of political activity going on. Um, like Anne, I was at the same Congress as her in Bengaluru just recently. But there are still really terrible comments that are made by Indian politicians and other men in power about rape and other issues. It is pleasing to see that there are some great movements going on. There's a 24-7 channel um, that plays on TV about women's issues, women's rights, and so again using the media to try and get the message across um, to the general public. So we'll watch and see. But before we get too complacent and think that there are problems in the rest of the world, one of the campaigns that I've been on, and I think many of you would have joined me on this campaign or have joined me, is about the fact that in our inpatient units to this day, we have assaults, we have sexual assaults on women patients. This is completely unacceptable in this day and age that a woman who is admitted to a public hospital for treatment is at risk of being assaulted. And the Mental Health Complaints Commissioner of Victoria um, last year commissioned um, me and MAPRC to conduct a statewide audit and those results have been put together um, and sent to governments um, with the hope that we can do something that is actually a capital works issue in many, many psych hospitals and psych wards. The UK did this. They, they actually legislated for gender segregated wards and their um, problems, of course, there's still female to female violence and male to male violence, but the sexual violence has diminished considerably. So the fact that we still have reports that come through I think is a real um, concern because there's very few concrete solutions in psychiatry, but this literally is a concrete solution that we could put forward. This is another sad statistic. When we compare the ABS data from 2011 to, from 1966 forward to 2011, the numbers of mid, early to mid teenage girls in Australia with incidences of maltreatment, sexual abuse, physical violence and or neglect is, has increased. Now that could be a, an artefact of reporting. Um, and we could argue the, the semantics of that. But nonetheless, this is, a, this is a very distressing trend. We think it's related to the changes in the family and social fabric structures, the, the loss of um, faith and literally loss of faith and the, and the religious institutions not being as powerful, et cetera, et cetera, and actually being, uh, you know, leading the way in abuse in, in many circumstances. So again, the issues are multiple, but nonetheless, the figures are really concerning. And that, that comes back to us as psychiatrists, because the biological, psychological and social impact of this is really, really long lasting. And again, there are such things as obesity, poor education, health service problems and uh, self-harm and rage that uh, really are a direct consequence of this early life trauma. So I'm going to rapidly run through some um, approaches in terms of women's mental health, having spoken about the social issues, which we are all obviously involved with, but not as a only as psychiatrists. I mean, this is where we have our colleagues from sociology, from politics, from all other fields. But here in the biology impacts on women's mental health, marry that with some of the things I've spoken about. We know that hormones, particularly the gonadotropin and uh, gonadal steroid hormones, such as estrogens, progesterones and androgens, are very potent in their impact on the modulation of dopamine, noradrenaline, glutamate, acetylcholine, serotonin. There are long-standing clinical and anecdotal evidence of biological hormone impact on the mental state for women. Specifically, the diseases that have a clear hormonal link uh, appear to be PMS or PMDD, and they're not the same, depression uh, and the oral contraceptive pill, the perinatal group of disorders, perimenopausal depression, and borderline personality disorder plus relapses of psychosis. I can't talk about all of them, um, but my problem is I get very excited and I try and pack too much in, but I will try and talk about some of the latest in, in these areas. Let's start with PMDD. This is a real entity. Um, it is not an imaginary entity. It is a real major depression that is crippling 
that presents for about one week to 10 days in the month. But unlike the uh, textbook picture of a woman who um, has a 28-day cycle with perfect ovulation at day 14 and then four to five days from day, uh, day 23 to day 28 um, premenstrually, it doesn't happen like that. That's, that. I haven't met that woman yet. So what we're seeing here is the descriptor of women who actually have some challenge in terms of their mental health. And the, cl the classic description is the woman who says, I'm okay, I'm okay, and then suddenly, uh, bang, there's this massive mood disturbance. Uh, so she goes from being functional to dysfunctional very rapidly. And similarly, gets out of the dysfunction to becoming functional again with that finger clicking sort of sudden uh, offset as well. So we look for that pattern. It may not be exactly premenstrual. It may be that it happens somewhere in the cycle, but that's enough to actually um, suggest that very strongly there is a hormonal component to the etiology here. The patient often keeps a diary, which is very helpful. So. For this condition, and this is a severe depression, she will have the full hand of the poor energy, the poor sleep, the poor concentration, suicidality, tearfulness, brain fog, can't concentrate, can't remember. Vitamins, lifestyle, herbal treatments are really not helpful. They are helpful for um, PMS, which is the mild uh, form, well, you know, it's still disruptive for the woman, but it is a milder form and usually has the physical health problems of breast tenderness and so on. But this is different. This is our old friend, major depression, but short term. So in this instance, it's really important, I believe, to think about trying the hormonal treatment. Try it first line because you can always stop the hormone treatment fairly quickly without withdrawal. Whereas first line um, SSRI, SNRI is difficult to stop and start because there are withdrawal symptoms. Now we've always talked about the pill and again I'll show you data from the pill study but um, not all pills are the same. In fact they're very very different. So over time we've worked through a number of different um, uh, observational studies to actually understand what pill is useful in this condition because progesterones can be very depressive. So we don't want to have the situation where we're worsening the depression by using a pill that will worsen the, de the depression because of the progesterone. It also needs to have a decent dose of estradiol because there are some low estrogen pills that will not be effective because estrogen is the good neuroprotective agent that we want here. So two strategies, we're trying to stabilise the hormonal fluctuations, but we're also trying to upregulate the estradiol receptors. So we favour a pill called Zoli, which is um, available. Unfortunately, it's um, slightly more expensive than the common pill. Um, the most common in use is Levelin, but this one has got a much bigger advantage in that nomigestrol is the progesterone, and that's a nice progesterone for the brain. Yes, the side effects are there, and particularly the acne. So somebody who's got really bad acne problems, this may make it worse. But that's where you have the discussion with the patient about what's worse for her, acne or the moribund depression for a week. And again, she will often make that decision herself. Now, if, if, we, if we find that this pill does give some relief, but not complete, and you're getting a bit of a breakthrough, we also, by the way, when I say continuous, that's three months of active pill without the sugar tablets. So again, the, the rationale there is to restabilize and have a continuous estradiol um, uh, upregulation. So for three months, no, nobody's going to develop a uterine thickening, etc. so perfectly safe. If you get a signal that this is helping but it's not enough, our next step is to add a bit more estradiol and we usually use 25 micrograms transdermal. This is a small patch um, because it again just increases the level of circulating estradiol in the CNS which helps the depression. Um, sometimes we also need to use obviously uh, SSRIs. Uh, if you've got an SSRI on board already, then that's something to continue. There are some issues where people do use on-off, but sometimes that can work, uh, but monitor that very closely. Um, this is where actually uh, valdoxin is useful in this because if you want to just augment the depression treatment for a week, you don't have the same um, serotonin withdrawal symptoms and then therefore that might be useful in that sense. 
We use a lot of pharmacogenomic testing. Uh, that actually is the wrong website. It's My DNA Life is the one I like. I don't have any connection with them other than we sometimes look at their data. Um, but pharmacogenomic testing is useful because it'll tell you whether this patient is going to respond to a small dose of this particular antidepressant um, or whether you need to think of a different class or dosing. Very useful. Third line treatments, uh, so now we'd be combining an antidepressant with estradiol or using aldosterone. Um, and that's again the hormonal strategy plus an antidepressant strategy. Fourth line treatment um, is, is the heroic sort of chemical menopause treatments, which we have had to use in somebody whose life is absolutely shot because of the awful um, uh, depression. By the time it's, it's become very significant in terms of suicidality and is maybe extending to more than one week, then we would think about fairly heroic um, actions there. Of course, I work with an endocrinologist, so at this point, you know, we're, we're doing this together. The hormonal fluctuations are thought to be the problem, but it's also about the different brain response to slight fluctuations. Some women are very, very sensitive to small uh, blips in the actual hormonal concentrations. Some women um, go through IVF treatment where they're bombarded with hormonal treatments and actually don't have a depression. So again, there's the individual variability. We are trying to develop a progesterone biomarker blood test so that we can try and get a handle on who might be sensitive and who might not be sensitive. But nonetheless, the action in that particular area is with allopregnanolone as a progesterone metabolite being a particular depressogenic um, agent. So uh, looking at this, we, we're trying to develop up that biomarker. The other interesting thing is we've found that a number of women who have PMDD have a high story of uh, associated early life trauma. So that, again, there might be something in that early life stress that makes them more vulnerable to mild or small changes in their physiological gonadal steroid concentrations in the CNS.